Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Hi there, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm so happy you're here. Um, first, what we'll do is a short meditation, and then I'll talk a little bit about the themes that I'm seeing arising in the flowers today, and we'll take it from there. So sitting in a comfortable position, and this is just going to be a couple minutes of you time. Obviously, if you're driving, keep your eyes open, <laughs> but you can decide to close your eyes if you like or keep them open and focused on one point in front of you. Taking a deep breath and just letting out any and every little stress or tension. Relaxing your body. And just scanning your body from the top of your head your face, your ears, your neck. If there's any tension in your neck, you can tip your chin closer to your chest, opening up that space. Noticing how your spine feels. It's been carrying you everywhere. How are your shoulders? Are you carrying any weights on your shoulders? Or are you feeling relatively light? Relaxing the area in your throat in your chest, in your arms, all the way down to your fingertips. Noticing how your heart feels. See if you can feel your heart beating. And bringing your awareness down into your belly, into your lower back. As you breathe in, see if you can breathe that air into your lower back as well as your belly. Noticing how your hips feel. If there's any tension in your hips, try to soften. Relax your pelvis, your thighs, your knees, your calves, your ankles, your feet, and your toes. And just having this really gentle, soft awareness of your body. Your precious body that takes you everywhere and does everything. You ask it to. I'm just noticing if just that short exercise alone just slowed you down just a little bit. Enough so that you can take a look at your inner landscape, your mind stream. You have lots of thoughts, like a fast moving river or waterfall, or is it like a trickling stream or a lake? We love all bodies of water. Every one of them is great. Just noticing what it's like. Noticing your emotional landscape. You don't have to give a name to it. Just noticing how everything feels. Energetically tuning in with yourself. Then we'll just take a couple seconds to just savor the spaciousness of just allowing ourselves to be. Enjoying how our bodies feel. Noticing our breath. If our monkey minds take us elsewhere, just bringing our attention gently back to our heart beating, our breath, and seeing how much we can relax our body with each breath. If you notice new little areas of tension in your body, soften them. Letting go of any resistance. And even if your eyes are closed, seeing if you can enjoy this feeling of spaciousness around you. The space that exists in between the objects. And then see if you can feel that spaciousness inside your own body. And then lastly, bringing your attention back to your heart space. Giving yourself a little extra love. You are a human being, which means that it's not always easy. 
And so giving yourself credit for all that you do and all that you are. And I'll just make the dedication that all of us come together for a specific purpose that we may do and say and create things for the highest benefit for ourselves and for all beings on the planet. And that we are here and open and ready to actualize our full potential. And that all of us may gain a piece of wisdom or insight or a sense of love or peace or joy by the time that this call is over. And if you want to make your own wish or prayer, you can kind of mentally put that out there if you have a question or something that's unresolved, that something may arise tonight that soothes or makes that make more sense. And when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes. You can stretch if you need to. You can wiggle if you need to. It's amazing what a few minutes of quiet will do. So on this call tonight, I'm just going to share on these calls, I do them about twice a year and I try to share things that are on the very cutting edge of anything that I'm learning personally or in the business. They're usually inextricably interwoven. And sometimes that means that it's a little bit obscure. It's kind of like finding language for something that doesn't that I don't quite yet have language for, but I think there's a gift in, you know, being right out there on the edge. So hopefully it will, whatever I'm saying tonight will resonate with you and it will make sense. I promise I'm not trying to be obscure. If you have any questions, I can help clarify. But these are things that I'm learning in the world of flower essences and flowers and from the work that I've been doing personally and in business. And there is this concept in Tibetan Buddhism of treasure finders, which I find so interesting. And I think that that informs how I'm gathering and perceiving and responding to the trends that I'm seeing. So just share a little bit about this concept of treasure finders. In Tibet, I don't know how many years ago, there was this particular teacher who was amazing. And his actually his top disciples were women. They were just these incredible women practitioners but when this teacher, Pema Sambhava was his name, when he died, everyone was freaking out. What are we going to do when he's gone? And so he said, no worries. I've hidden all these different teachings around in trees, in the land, in rocks, in places. And I'll make sure that there are people that are called treasure finders who come later to find these treasures because there will be new sicknesses in the future. There will be new problems, new things arise that will require a completely different kind of teaching then than in what we have now. And so I can't wait to actually to have Lisa Reinhardt on the podcast because she has a lot of personal experiences working with these actual real treasure finders in Tibet, in India. But so I think like, I think in terms of that, when I'm out in the field and collecting flower essences, I'm paying attention to the information that's coming through and the different themes of the flowers. And so that sort of concept is, is informing what I'm sharing tonight. So first thing, what I noticed is in the last 15 months or so, we started doing these events called the flower lounges. And one of the main reasons that we started doing them is to really just to offer a space for people to be. And I know meditation has become much, much more popular these days, which makes me really happy. And I started looking at the flower essences that I've collected in that similar time period. And when I looked at the themes from the last few big collection trips, I realized there were two themes that were presenting themselves in a really big way. So and here's why I think, this is my, my theory of why they're arising at this particular time, different from say 10, 20, 30 years ago. So as our world becomes increasingly digitally connected, we're becoming more and more attached to our cell phones and social media. I, for one, am completely swept up in that tidal wave as well. 
And it's strange, right? Because you notice your own behavior changing in your own lifetime. So for example, people that we used to call on the phone now get our communication via text. I remember the day I started texting my mom instead of calling her was really strange. Or we started getting wholesale orders from people through text. And I just thought that was so bizarre. And I think today it's become actually quite rare that we just pick up our phones and call someone. It's sort of like, you know, almost a disturbance these days to call someone. We always reach for text. And in this constant immersion in social media, we often disconnect ourselves from the very people that are in the same room with us so that we can see what's going on on Instagram or in Facebook in the world. And then there is also this sort of all pervasiveness of the quote unquote news infiltration. Sometimes you could even call it brainwashing that comes through the digital sources that are in the palms of our hands. And so when we reflect on, you know, what are the major cultural influences in the last 10 years, you know, internet, social media, and handheld devices have been huge and texting and emailing. What I think, what I think about all that is that it can lead to, not always, but it can lead to a lack of really deep intimacy, listening and connecting that oftentimes, you know, we're craving this connection and we, you know, look to connect with people through social media, but it's so different from the kind of face-to-face intimacy that we used to have, say, 20 years ago. And it's funny because in a way, we are more available to people, more people can see what we're up to through social media, but in other ways, we're less available to people because we don't always expect people to just pick up their phone and call us. And so I think a lot of people end up sometimes feeling more disconnected you know, you might be more up to date with what's happening in your loved one's lives, but we might not actually even be engaged in real intimate communications with them. Or if, if we are communicating, they may not be on this really deep, authentic level. And we kind of get used to seeing the surface level view of someone's life, especially edited and polished. <laughs> and the other thing I see is that culturally, it sort of solidifies the habit of letting ourselves be influenced by others. And so rather than tapping in or tuning into what we know in our bodies and our hearts, or from our own personal experiences of things that we have lived through, that we know to be real, with increasing momentum, we just sort of believe at face value what we read or hear from digital sources. And so I really wanted to have this call because of these themes that I keep seeing pop up and I and I I see the solutions popping up as well, which is really fascinating. And I think that what we will be continuing to offer, not just in this call, but through the flower essences, through the events, through the flower evolution program, through retreats, through every single thing we do, probably this theme will run through, which is um, tools and methods and practices to experience deeper intimacy and human connection to, you know, ways to really cut through superficiality and get right to our core and what's priority for us in our life, to have a sense of urgency, not urgency like rushing, but a sense, you know, that life is short. So let's just like get the real deep meaning out of it. And these would also be practices that I believe will balance out these sort of robotic (laughs) effects of all the tech that we're using. And It will also help us process experiences and emotions when we have a rough time so that they don't get stuck in the body. And also these practices and tools will help us express things, especially when you have loss, like let's say somebody dies or they go away and you can't have contact with them. If you have something to say, but there's no receiver, so practices that will allow you to express yourself. And also practices to teach ourselves to be more present with what's going on around us, what, you know, within ourselves and the environment and the people around us. So what I'm seeing come through the language of flowers are two main themes. And, you know, this first one I might have seen every now and then, but now it's really like very, very common. And that, I, that is a constant invitation to deepen into spacious awareness states. You can call that a lot of different things, being in the present moment, and you can get there from a lot of different frames of reference 
or through different means or methods. Um, but essentially, it's the being state. And what that opens us up to is the ability to get out of our mental mind, um, you know, the thinking, thinking mind. And it's not just about sitting in silence, but being able to experience that state all the time during our daily grind, when we're on our computers, when we're driving, when we're talking to someone, when we're having breakfast. It's about, you know, using that as a touchstone and kind of keep coming back to that beingness. And then the second theme I'm seeing, so we did the meditation, that's sort of like a little reminder of what it feels like to be. Um, but I'm going to focus more on the second theme during this call because I think it's so interesting. And that is an emphasis on languages that are either unspoken or nonlinear, like energetic communication, body language, artistic, poetic, and musical expression. I was just driving to the office this morning thinking, oh, it's so interesting how, you know, there are these, you see on Instagram, people who have like essentially become famous because they start writing their poetry on Instagram, putting them on the tiles and people share and they develop these massive followings. And then I've seen friends of mine write poetry. I've started writing poetry. And I thought, wow, that's such a cool trend. Like maybe what will it be like in five years? Will will everyone be writing poetry? You know, will that be a form of expression that we tap into to, to, to have more intimacy in our lives? I don't know. We'll see. But the, the theme is that rather than limit our communication with each other to conversation or talking, what I'm seeing pop up in the flowers today are the any sort of quality that enhances our ability to tune into something that is more felt and perceived rather than seen or verbally spoken. So it's about rediscovering and actively practicing these styles of communication, you could call it, or expression that are not spoken. And these, I'm guessing, are ancient languages because once we pick them back up, we seem to understand them innately. We're just not tapping into them actively on a daily basis. So they're very simple human ways of interaction that are profound, but not practiced very often today. So a super simple example would be dancing, for example, when two people dance together, whether they're touching in a partner dance or they're not touching and they're just grooving out in the same room. There is this particular type of communication and shared experience that you have with another person when you're dancing in the kitchen or whatever um, that has become rare in today's world. If you just think about, like, think about wherever you work, your workplace, and imagine what that would be like if, say, every day at 2 p.m., a little bell rang and everybody knew that it meant that it's like time for a three minute dance moment. And everybody got up from their desks or wherever they were and, you know, turned cranked up a tune and grooved out and danced for three minutes. Like depending on where you work, this may be interesting or comical <laughs> because it, it's like, it's kind of out of our comfort zone, right? It's like, it's actually kind of intimate. It's pretty intimate and involves some level of vulnerability and seeing beyond physical appearances through a window into somebody's true essence that happens when we do that. Um, and this ironically isn't something that takes place in our everyday life and our verbal conversations with people. It's easy to sort of gloss over that sometimes and obviously not possible through social media communication or texting. Another example is like I was saying before, poetry. So artistic expression and even though poetry uses words, there's something else going on in the background because it's such a metaphorical language, poetry, that we, we can see images in the backs of our minds that come through poetry. And just like the emotion that comes through when you look at a painting or the depth and range of feeling that comes through music, um, the unspoken and complex art of body language are other examples of these types of more subtle and highly intimate expressive forms of communication. And then there's energetic communication, which, you know, 
is very interesting and also means that we're not limited to being in the same physical space with someone. We can travel beyond space and time into a form of connection that we've all experienced, but don't necessarily have a clear intellectual understanding of. Some of the ancient forms, like we could call them ancient forms of language or expression or communication would be things like rituals, ceremonies, dance. I even experience it. For example, I'm, I've re been really into salsa dancing in the past year and it's so improvisational and you really have to listen to the other person's body. So I see it there in any forms of movement, especially when they're improvisational in music in poetry, when you're speaking in images and symbols, and even when you're getting signs from nature, or just this whole idea of getting signs from your environment in the first place, you know, asking for a sign and then, you know, seeing what song pops on or what sign you see or, or a particular animal that pops out in a way that you're so crystal clear and aware that you sense that there's some deeper meaning to it. It makes sense to you. And this happens actually quite often in when we're, when we're collecting flower essences. It happened on the very first flower essence collection trip in British Columbia in a way that was just outrageous with the animals. Some of you may have heard the story with the bear and the snake and the butterfly and all of the crazy animals that came out to lead me and show me what flowers would actually be the most, really essentially the most important in the last 10 years in the last decade. And then we had had another experience this past July when we were collecting an orchid, super rare orchid essence that we hunted down in Minnesota when it was sunset and we were so excited to find the flower and there was just this beautiful apricot and blue sky and there were no clouds except for this tiny little one above us. And as we were just standing there staring in awe at the flower, this little tiny cloud above us rumbled thunder. And it was incredible because in the moment it felt, it felt so, we felt so interconnected with the environment and it literally felt like the place was welcoming us. And that one tiny little cloud started to rain, these like big ploppy raindrops, not the kind that makes you wanna run undercover, but just sort of this cute little ploppy rain for five minutes and then it was gone. Um, and it's just so, so magical. And again, in Costa Rica, we had similar experiences where hummingbirds and these crazy, beautiful blue morphos, really electric blue butterflies showed us where orchids were in the jungle. So really like that sort of communication with nature, animals, trees, flowers, things around you, I would call that also, you know, put that in the same I would put that in the same category. And we could call it active wisdom or listening. And I think that there are there are three things that we can practice to, to tap into this box of ways of communication. And one is to just be willing to take an active role, meaning if you listen, then you can act on it. So being able to consciously co-create, not going with the flow. I don't mean going with the flow. I just mean like actually taking an active role in the experience. So like, for example, an animal showing me a flower and then having the trust to know, okay, then I need to collect this one and doing it, even though it seems crazy and outrageous. Because it seems like going with the flow kind of seems like you relinquish your own creative capacity to you know, create life versus taking an active role and really trusting the kind of communication you're receiving. The other thing is to be willing to take risks and do things you've never done before. Because usually this kind of communication or expression, it's either taking place in a situation we've never been in before or it is arising out of some sort of difficulty or challenge we've never faced before. I know that last year I had a really very unexpected, like intense experience happen. And that's what like spun me out into writing poetry. It was just something I had never done before and would have probably thought it was crazy or indulgent or strange. And 
and in that moment, it was like the only way I could get through it was to write poetry. And I think about a really dear friend of mine who I just interviewed recently on the podcast, Robin Sandomirsky. Some of you may be familiar with her and her work. And she spent, during July of last year, she spent two weeks with her best friend as she died of cancer and, you know, rode that whole wave of transformation and transition with her best friend as she, you know, prepared to die and as she eventually passed. And the podcast, if you haven't listened to that one with Robin, you should. It's amazing. It's so good and so inspiring. Everyone on the planet should listen to it because it's it talks about, you know, something that we all will face many, many times in our life, which is death. But she talks about it as, you know, being this experience that she had never had to face before and how beautiful it was and how exquisite it was and all the rituals around it and the things that arose and the things they did in the days leading up. And, you know, this was a situation she had never been in before. And so she was just sort of willing to follow the, follow the golden thread and, and, and sort of take, be courageous and brave and do things that she had never done before. And then the third, the third way to tap, you know, to keep tapping into this kind of these types of communication are to be willing to practice them over and over and over, because what I'm finding is they're not knowledge-based. So even this call is like silly because we should all just be in one big room doing stuff like writing poetry, moving together, meditate. We did do a meditation, <laughs> but like really looking in each other's eyes and like creating and experiencing intimacy because it's, it isn't knowledge-based, it's wisdom-based, it's experience-based. It's something that arises from within us and something that we perceive from the outside. So it takes the, the, the willingness to sort of practice it over and over. And I would say an example of that would be, you know, if you find a practice that works for you. So for example, in my case, poetry, or it could be a movement practice or you know, something that surprised you, but it worked. So keep doing it. <laughs> or some way that you used your intuition to tap into a way of doing things that was more seamless or effortless or easy, then notice when that happens and keep doing it, keep practicing it over and over. If, you know, in terms of collecting flower essences, that's one thing that you know, the animals were something that I just only had experienced in Canada. And suddenly they really, really came back in Costa Rica. And we had howler monkeys showing us how to find orchids and butterflies and hummingbirds and other crazy animals. So just being willing to, you know, to keep being courageous and following that, even if it's a little bit odd or strange. So I wanted to do a little exercise with you guys. And this is when you'll take out your piece of paper and your pen. And I mean, typically I wouldn't recommend using your, your mental mind to answer these questions. That's why, you know, as we do offerings in the future, we're, we're actually going to be using poetry and movement, meditation and flower elixirs and rituals. But since we're on a phone call, I'm gonna try to ask you some questions that are reflective and see if we can get you to, to sort of tap into that other type of expression or listening by just using your stream of consciousness. Uh, just, you know, no filter, no judgment. It can be silly. It can be strange. And probably as it usually is with stream of consciousness writing, it doesn't make as much sense as you're writing it because it's just sort of you're watching it come out of you right as it's coming out of you. And maybe later you'll look at it and you'll make more sense of it. It will be more clear to you. So I'm going to ask you six questions and I would just ask to try not to like think about it. Just, you know, don't, don't think about it intellectually, actively, just write whatever comes to your mind without filtering, even if it makes no sense to you in the moment, even if it's just a word or a few words. And see if you can focus on 
Like, what does it feel like? And what are the sensations that arise in your body as you're writing? Okay, so the first question is, if you were a tree, what does it feel like to lose your leaves and fall? So how does a tree let go of its leaves and how does that feel to let go of its leaves in the fall? Or what does it feel like to let go of the children who climb the limbs as you grow older? How does a tree love without attachment? You can use any one of those examples that makes sense to you. How does a tree love without attachment? What does it feel like to lose your leaves in the fall? And the second grouping of questions. If you were a flower in full bloom, what does that feel like? And this is a related question. What does it feel like to be a flower in full bloom without hiding anything? What does it feel like to be in full regalia without holding anything back fully, fully yourself? How do others perceive you when you are totally in full bloom? How do they respond to you? The third question is, if you or a mushroom forest, you know, the little mycelium that travel underneath the ground in this internet system. And they're connected to everything underneath the forest floor. So if you were a part of, or if you were this mycelium or mushroom forest, what does it feel like knowing everything is connected? What does it feel like to be interconnected with everything around you? What does it feel like knowing everything is interconnected and meaningful? And the fourth question is a little strange, but just play along with me. <laughs> Imagine that you're a bat that's blind, that simply uses its sonar system to navigate the world and to navigate space and objects. What does it feel like to find your way using these other sensations and forms of listening? And if you want to, you can sort of connect that back into your own body and say, you know, instead of a sonar system, if, it, if it's an energetic system, and we are listening to other types of sensations that are new, what does it feel like to find our way like that? Moving through space. And you don't have to write if you don't want to write, if you are finding that you much prefer just sort of sinking into this sense of what it feels like. You can do that if you don't want to write. And then imagine, this is the fifth, the fifth little exercise. Imagine that you are a night blooming flower of your favorite color. And you're opening up in the middle of the night to the light of the full moon. And a storm just passed and the clouds parted. And suddenly the timing is right. What does that feel like to open yourself to the best possible outcome and to your full potential, which may be unexpected or you may not even be able to articulate it. What does it feel like to be totally open to your full potential knowing that you have no idea what that means and you're going into a realm of total unknown? And then for the last question, 
What does it feel like to be a tree rooted into the earth without the ability to run away? Especially when it's windy and cold and there's freezing rain, maybe even a hurricane. What does it feel like to be a tree rooted to the earth in those situations? And what does it feel like to face the music or to move through that experience without running away? So these are the six questions or exercises that I wanted to take you through. And I think you can get a little taste of what is hard to articulate with words and what it means to try to perceive something that we haven't tried to perceive before or try to tap into qualities that we may have or skills that we may have that we're not necessarily using actively. I know those questions could be writing prompts and you could you know, write something from, from that space. Or if there was a particular one that you liked, it can be a really good reminder. You know, if you're in your car and you're driving on your way to work, to sort of imagine what that may feel like as you're driving to be a part of this interconnected force with everything around you in a way that's totally meaningful. And just exploring what that feels like if it were true, and just sort of practicing those experiences or openness. So those six questions came from six uh, flowers that I collected in the recent history in Singapore and in Sedona and in Iceland. And those questions are based on particular qualities or messages or insights language that was coming through the flowers in terms of their sort of superpowers or their teachings, essentially, the secret teachings of flowers. And in my experience, flower essences have been so key to help us transition into rewiring or in a sense it's like downloading a new update you know how we download updates for our computers and our phones for our operating systems it's like it's like getting the next download and so the ways that we can start to embrace this type of communication or expression within our life is besides flower essences could be you know when a strong emotion arises to feel where that is in our body. Like sometimes just getting into our body is, is a huge lesson in itself. If we have a really strong emotion arise to move through it or to dance it out, to write it out, to paint it out, to do something creative, to build a, a mandala, to take a walk in nature, to ask for signs from mother nature or to create something, anything, even create a music playlist. And one thing that's sort of a practical thing that I could offer would be to listen to, there's three podcasts that I would recommend that actually go into this topic more. One is Flora Boli, who talks about intuitive creativity. The other is who I mentioned before, Robin Sandomirsky, and we talk about death. And the other is this woman from Tasmania and her name is Grace Pundik. And she has another, we just had an amazing conversation about this similar type of concept that's arising in her work and what she sees in the world. So I would, you know, really like dive into these areas in your life if you're not already to maybe just start dipping your toes in and seeing what this feels like for you. I know sometimes I feel like it's an indulgence, but then I remember that, you know, maybe I'm just remembering a different way to be in the world and perceive and communicate and express. And so I'm super excited because I'm going to just shamelessly plug this event because if you are anywhere near New York, February 13th, we're having a flower lounge event 
And what most people don't know, because I haven't actually, we haven't even announced it yet, is that we're doing our very first workshop on February 14th. It's Valentine's Day from one to five in New York. So if you're anywhere near New York or you feel like taking a trip to the big city, we would totally love to see you. We're renting this crazy Airbnb that's like five stories in Manhattan and we'll for the workshop we'll invite everybody in and it'll be really intimate and it'll be myself and Morgan Farley who is an incredible poet and story whisperer she just pulls stories out of people it's incredible and Linda Singh who is used to be a professional dancer and now she is doing what's called social presencing theater which is the most magical type of movement practices that are both meditative and communicative and expressive and take you out of your comfort zone. It's just awesome. So on the 14th, we're doing a workshop called Tending Your Heart. And we'll be working with some new orchids for love that I just created a couple of weeks ago in Costa Rica and doing some incredible writing and movement practices that have to do with your heart and love. So if you're interested in a workshop, that's on the 14th and the flower lounge event is on the 13th. And also on the 13th, Robin Sandomirsky is going to be at that event. It's going to be incredible. We're going to do body poetry and flower journeys and love poems and wisdom movement practices and have flower elixirs from orchids. The whole entire Lotus Way team will be there and there's some really interesting people coming. So if this at all tweaks your interest, let us know. And we'll also be sending out emails this Saturday about the workshop and the event. So why I mentioned that, of course, I want you to come. It would be amazing. I mean, this is going to be the best event we've ever done. I think some people will walk out of there like, what the heck was that? It's just going to be so amazing and transformative. But also I bring it up because it is, it's like, our way of sort of following, you know, follow, walking our talk and really offering to people an experience of these practices and methods that we've been using to access different types of communication and expression and intimacy and connection with ourselves and other human beings. And then I should also mention that we have a new flower evolution program coming up. It is the next six months of flower elixirs coming from Iceland, which, you know, the flowers have a lot to do with plugging into the Mother Earth. Like we've got one in February called the frog orchid, which is essentially the whole reason we went to Iceland was to hunt down this orchid. And it's for one of the first themes that I was saying of seeing arise a lot, which is experiencing life free of the monkey mind like what what it feels like to to just engage in spacious awareness or like that tree that just lets go of its leaves like love without attachment then we'll work with wild pansy from iceland and that quality of that flower is about like feeling what it feels like to be in full bloom without hiding then after that, we're, we'll be working with Angelica, wild Angelica flower, which is, it's all about activating that sense of interconnectedness and meaningful qualities of life. And then we'll be working with a flower out of Sedona called the Indian paintbrush. It's like a neon, neon orange red flower that helps us wayfind in different ways, wayfinding kind of like the bat and having a deeper awareness of our surroundings and of interconnection. Um, after that, we'll be working with two flowers from Singapore. And Singapore, Singapore is such an interesting place. It's Southeast Asia, I find it just is so abundant and lush. And, you know, those jungle plants can just like take over a whole area in no time. And so the flowers from Southeast Asia, to me, you know, they appear to be about flourishing and acceleration and growth and magnetizing the people and situations that would support us to move into our next phase um, of life. So there's the cannonball flower, which is a crazy beautiful flower. Uh, it's incredible. And that's about opening yourself to the best possible potential free of expectations or clamping down on yourself. It's really opening up to the unexpected and the unknown 
awesomeness that life has to offer. And the pink torch ginger is about dissolving resistance, about moving through, uh, moving through everything, even difficult experiences and allowing wisdom to arise from it. So if you're interested in exploring more of these types of flowers that I've been finding that are helping us to either practice just being and accessing that sort of resting, being, perceiving, spacious awareness state, or the second theme, helping us perceive things in a different way, tapping into different styles of perception or communication or expression, we'll be focusing on these themes in the next Flower Evolution. If you don't know anything about the Flower Evolution program yet, you can uh, find out about it on our website, and that's at lotusway.com slash movement. Um, and you can find out everything there. We have monthly meditations and love notes. And every week I record something like a secret message for everybody. There's a Facebook group and a discount and all that stuff. You can find that on the website. So I hope that this call has been valuable for you and that it is making sense that you are resonating with these themes. I'm curious um, if any of you have questions, you can post them up in the chat window and I can take questions. I do see that somebody asked for a list of flowers so we can see if we can put that into the, the email with the recording. So if you are interested in this type of exploration with me, I would be so honored if you check out the Flower Lounge event and the workshop that'll be happening in New York. We'll be sending out an email on Saturday if you're not on our list. Uh, we may also be posting information about it on social media and then check out the Flower, Flower Evolution program um, coming up by going to our website and clicking on Flower Evolution. Thank you guys so much for being on this call and giving me the opportunity to, to really open up about these crazy wild things that I've been discovering out in the field with the flowers. It's a, a total gift. It's an absolute gift to, to, to be able to share that with you. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful night and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.